Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College, and we finally made it to our last video on the anatomy of the nephron. And we're going to focus on something called the juxtaglomerular apparatus, which we tend to abbreviate as JGA. The juxtaglomerular apparatus, or the JGA, if you listen to the, the name, juxta, meaning sitting at the junction of the glomerulus. This is an apparatus formed between the junction of your distal convoluted tubule and your arterioles, especially your afferent arteriole. So there are different parts to this so-called apparatus. Now, it has many different functions. And they're listed here. Here, for one, the, the juxtaglomerular apparatus is constantly checking the composition of the filtrate that has formed here in, or that has made it, I should say, to the distal convoluted tubule. Perhaps I should uh, make clear that you understand that this is our distal convoluted tubule. This is our PCT for proximal convoluted tubule. Not only that, but your JGA also can adjust or in, somehow adjust how much blood will enter into the glomerulus. We'll learn how that works. And that's going to impact the GFR. What does GFR stand for? It stands for the glomerular filtration rate. In other words, how fast is the blood filtered? We'll talk quite a bit about GFR in one of the next videos. Your, this apparatus is also responsible for producing the two hormones that our kidneys secrete, and that is called renin, as in the renin-angiotensin um, aldosterone mechanism, the RAA mechanism we have mentioned before, and of course EPO, erythropoietin, which regulates erythropoiesis. And then finally, it can actually influence how much filtrate is formed and therefore also impacts systemic blood pressure. So this is a very powerful structure of a nephron of the kidney. There are three cell types in the juxtaglomerular apparatus. I'm just going to um, briefly discuss them here, but then we'll go over them once again in the next image. So the first cell type is called the juxtaglomerular cell. And this is a cell or these cells are found in the arteriole or wall because they're smooth muscle cells. They're, they're primarily in the afferent arteriole. They're easy to pick out because they contain little granules that, are, that contain renin. So this is the, the area, the histological area where the renin is secreted to kick in the renin angiotensin mechanism, right? We learned about the renin-angiotensin mechanism once before. We'll look at it in much greater detail uh, once we hit the physiology. These cells can also function as mechanoreceptors and detect whether or not the, the arterial or wall is being stretched or not and respond accordingly. Then the second cell type we call the macula densa cells. The dense, basically saying a spot that looks dense. And it's this time it is in the wall of the distal convoluted tubule that touches the arteriole area, particularly the afferent arteriole. And you can again really pick out that area because the cells are really densely packed. They almost like really closely packed simple columnar epithelial cells. These cells function more as chemoreceptors and osmoreceptors. Of what? Of the filtrate, which is present in the distal convoluted tubule. So they're constantly kind of tasting what is present in there, what the concentration is, and then can set off uh, the, the appropriate response. <clears throat> Those are the two main cell types that we will keep bringing up as we get into the physiology of the kidneys. But there's actually a third cell type 
and we'll discuss them here, but more than likely not really bring them up again. Um, we find that these so-called mesangial cells or mesangial cells, whichever way you want to say that, both within the glomerular area, in between the capillaries, but also in between the arterial or arterial arterioles, that is both the afferent and efferent arteriole. These cells seem to have a role in phagocytizing those substances that kind of get stuck in that basement membrane area of the filtration membrane. Remember how substances and water need to go first through the, the fenestrations of the endothelial layer of the glomerulus and then they have to make it through the fused basement membrane layer and then they have to make it through the filtration slits between the pedicels. So when things get stuck in there, these guys can um, somehow remove these substances and deal with them. They also have contractile properties, which in, can somehow also influence uh, the rate at, at, of uh, capillary filtration. So here then, we're looking at an image that really illustrates the details of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Now, the first time I looked at this image, it seemed really overwhelming. But once I sat down with it, I thought this is a really good image to share with you guys. So here we go. So what I'm going to do is go over all the different parts with you. It'll be a nice review. And then, of course, uh, include those different cells I just introduced you to that are part of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. So let's start first with the overview picture, which you see in the top left. There is our nephron that is being drained into our collecting ducts. And what we're really just focusing on is our renal corpuscle with our afferent and efferent arteriole. Notice too that in this picture, it is our top arteriole here that is going to be the afferent arteriole because it has a wider diameter. So the blood is going in this way and coming out that way, okay? So which is kind of different from the way some of the earlier illustrations have uh, been. So once again, you're going to see blood coming in this way and then leaving this way. Maybe I better label these guys so that you don't get confused. So we have our afferent arteriole here and we have our efferent arteriole here. Okay, so that's already a couple of structures pointed out. And of course, they're lined with um, epithelial tissue, simple squamous, but also some uh, smooth muscle in their walls, as you see there, point where number eight is pointing. So these reddish cells here are definitely representing more of the smooth muscle cells. If we focus on the Bowman's capsule, then we see here our parietal layer made up of uh, simple squamous epithelial tissue that abruptly transitions to simple cuboidal epithelial tissue with lots of microvilli where we start our proximal convoluted tubule, which is illustrated as B here, right? If we look at the visceral layer, of our Bowman's capsule. Remember, it has all those podocytes with pedicels. Here you see a podocyte, which then has all of the little praying fingers here, or intertwined fingers to show, like praying hands. Here's another podocyte and another podocyte, etc., etc. These lumens, on the other hand, here represent the lumens of our capillaries, so we're not illustrating any of the blood inside, and all the capillaries in turn are lined, in turn are lined with the simple squamous epithelial tissue or endothelium. Now, amidst almost looking like filler up cells with, um, within the glomerulus, we see the cells labeled as 5A, and those are those mesangial or mesangial cells. We also see them 
over here under 5B, kind of looking like filler up cells between our efferent arteriole and our actual juxtaglomerular apparatus, which we still need to talk about. Um, but before we do that, one last structure to point out, and that is right here. This is our distal convoluted tubule. And of course, it is this structure here in my figure, uh, you know, about right here. We could say maybe more the pinkish one right here. And that is going to come in very close contact with our arterioles, particularly our afferent arterioles. So where this happens, we see some changes. So we're now going to focus on these three cells here. Okay, we've already learned that these guys are those mesangeal cells that can act phagocytically, especially here in the glomerular area, and here probably influencing some contractile properties of those capillaries. Uh, I'm sorry, of those arterioles. Let's leave those behind now and let's really focus on the two major cell types that I think are better understood. First of all, in the wall of our arterioles, most, mostly our afferent arteriole, we have the so-called juxtaglomerular cells. Number six, the juxtaglomerular cells. Notice they have little granules inside of them. Those are the renin granules. Those are the renin granules. They're going to be released when these cells and the rest of the macula densa apparatus can help out detect that the blood pressure is too low in the body. And therefore renin is released. But we also have these cells. Notice how closely placed they are in this particular area. That's, that's, those are the cells that form the wall of our distal convoluted tubule as they touch these macula densa cells. I'm sorry, as they touch these juxtaglomerular cells. So these in the distal convoluted tubule, those are the macula densa cells. So let me label this a little bit better for you. So these are your JG cells and these are your MD cells for macula densa. They're the ones that are constantly tasting the uh, filtrate inside of your distal convoluted tubule. You know, they detect what concentration there is, a solute concentration there is, um, um, what the composition is, even to some extent how fast the flow is of the, the filtrate. So your mesangial cells, maybe I should label those two as MES in this area, and of course there's more here. But these three here, this, this little apparatus right here, that is that juxtaglomerular apparatus. And once you learn the details about how blood pressure in the body is regulated with the help of our kidneys, which we've looked at somewhat before, but now in much greater detail, you'll see how important this particular part, that juxtaglomerular apparatus, is in our kidneys to regulate systemic blood pressure. So this is finally the end of the anatomy of the nephrons in the kidneys and we're ready to get going on the physiology of the kidneys.